All right, hello everyone. Um, so I'm Pete Fishman. I go by Fish. Um, I am the co-founder and CEO of Mozart Data. So I'm going to be giving a little bit of an inside baseball talk on um, the MDS. I think about the modern data stack a lot. Um, it's a lot of uh, what I've spent my entire career in, and it's something I'm very, very passionate about. And I am going to give a talk sort of subtitled, uh, the reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. Um, so all very relevant for MDS Fest. So, um, you know, I, I sort of saw the uh, agenda for today's uh, speakers and I saw Pedram was on the uh, speaker list and he has this, uh, you know, great sort of uh, Nietzsche tweet. Um, which is basically about the MDS being uh, dead and and who, of course, are, are, are the killers of the MDS, of course, ourselves um, and ZERP. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, kind of the state of where, where tooling is, um, how it sort of continues to help people and um, why I, I feel like sort of all of the claims of death have been... Uh, vastly exaggerated. So this sort of uh, goes back to the 90s and the the uh, innovation adoption curve uh, made famous by Jeff Moore, uh, this idea of crossing the chasm. And this is all very much not new. So what crossing the chasm is largely about is that um, if you think of sort of like a bell curve of, uh, in some sense, innovators and adopters, um, the the innovation and adoption starts the left of that bell curve, the the sort of the techies, and then eventually, after a long, long time, uh, makes its way to the the skeptics and the laggards. I would put, uh, you know, my parents as 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 one of the the last people to have uh, adopted, say, uh, getting getting an Uber from the airport uh, uh, to to visit me. So um, if we think about sort of this uh, motion from left to right, that's a lot of what I think of as the current strife and struggle of the modern data stack. So the modern data stack um, had incredible adoption amongst the innovators and early adopters, especially in the sort of um, last few years of, uh, of one, increased technical capabilities and two, um, you know, great funding for a combination of startups and specifically startups in this space of the modern data stack. Um, and now it faces the challenge of the chasm. So that sort of space where we have to get the modern data stack adopted and the values of the modern data stack uh, <laughs> uh, the values of the modern data stack uh, to the early majority or the pragmatist. So uh, in making this talk, I, I was really fired up to find a slide from uh, 2013. So in 2013, I worked at a company, I worked at Microsoft. Um, I was actually working at Yammer, which had been acquired by Microsoft. And I found sort of uh, a slide that I had given in a talk, um, which was like, hey, you know, we built Mozart Data, the company that I now work at. We actually built it in 2013. The company started in 2020, but um, in practice, it started in 2013. Um, we had a tool uh, at Yammer called Avocado, um, which was composed of two tools, one called uh, Squirrel, which was basically a SQL editor, and one called Integrity, which was um, effectively the the ELT pieces that we are familiar with today and the tools for data analysts to do both of those things. And this was a really um, nice and sort of uh, fun example for me to revisit of, um, of really the techies, the innovators. Where we saw the modern data stack come out of were really well-funded startups of the early 2010s that were building these all internally, that had to build and hire big data platform teams um, to build out these sort of data systems that they were getting a lot of advantage on. Um, today, the modern data stack is available uh, to everyone, you know, with clicks of a button uh, and uh, you know, it's incredible, but if we think back on sort of the early adoption, it was obviously 
these types of really well-funded, very successful startups, and many of t- you know today's data tools came out of these startups. Um, you know, you can think of uh, a lot. A lot of the most famous ones basically came from the really great startups, the the Ubers, the Airbnbs, the Facebooks of this of this era. And now these are ubiquitous that any startup can use today without having these very expensive teams. So if I were to map the innovation adoption curve, uh, you know, I sort of hinted at the innovators were these data engine, data platform teams at these very innovative startups. Um, the early adopters uh, are are the folks that found the title uh, analytics engineers, and this is this is a group where there was tremendous product market fit of the modern data stack. Their work, disseminating their work, um, sharing their work. Uh, through BI tools, through DBT, through uh, other transformation tools, through um, a variety of, of tools that were part of the best practices of these companies that accelerated that work, that gained trust in their work, that amplified their work. Um, you know, we've been really excited. This group has been really excited by the tools of the modern data stack. Now, the question becomes, who is the early majority? Are these laggard analytics engineers? Are these data analysts? Are these operators? Are these even marketers? Um, and one of the things that I think has has sort of led to this uh, sort of the modern data stack being dead is that there's this cacophony of um, uh, like an echo chamber of us talking about our data tools to ourselves and bragging about the awesomeness of our data tools. Our data tools are really awesome. When I think about sort of the modern data stack today, as opposed to what it looked like, you know, in that case, it was uh, 12 years ago. Um, it is incredible. You know, 12 years ago, you would spend millions of dollars, uh, have a data platform team that might be, you know, a dozen engineers. Um, so you might have a multi-million dollar bill just to get started on the modern data stack. Today, most of these tools offer either free trials, you know, are open source, are uh, available, you know, with a free tier. Uh, On some level, you can get started with basically nothing, not even swiping a credit card. And the person that can get started is an analytics engineer needing no data engineers. Um, But this sort of this sort of amazingness is just, you know, is a lot of us talking at one another um, and highlighting kind of the wins, but from the perspective of ourselves that really understand how incredible this tooling is. Um, but we really need to, you know, cross the chasm to get into, um, you know, essentially new populations that are going to adopt the modern data stack so that we can continue having a community that builds out best practices and, you know, having buyers of these tools and then essentially the tools, um, you know, building for that buyer. And, you know, one of the things called out in the tweet was ZERP. So um, I tried to create a slide that best explains uh the 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 importance of the dramatic change from going from a zero interest rate to a very much non-zero interest rate. So in a zero interest rate environment, imagine you create a stack of coins or imagine that you create surplus or value or a valuable insight that can drive a business decision that's going to make your company money. In a zero interest rate environment, this tends to be recurring. So you 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 take that insight you make money from that insight, um, or you know, you create a dashboard that's going to provide you that insight consistently, and that money stack is going to be created today and in the future, and again in the future, and again and again. And what you have is a bunch of stacks of money. And when you aggregate these stacks and sort of uh, take the sum of these stacks, it ends up being a really important insight and valued insight. Um, so the data tools that help provide that stack are very valuable and providing that reliably, consistently, et cetera, you know, contribute to this sort of never ending set of stack of coins. When you're in a non-zero interest rate environment, the DCF, the discounted cash flows on future flows are of course smaller. There's a, in the denominator is in fact the interest rate. I'm an economist by trade. So um, I think of it very much like this picture. And what you can see is that effectively the stacks diminish and the, you know, the sum of all these stacks ends up being less. 
So this has two very direct impacts on our ecosystem. The first is that the venture capital world is less inclined to fund uh, tools because they effectively have the same challenge. So if you you know, have a tool that's producing a bunch of recurring revenue, that recurring sum is worth less in obviously a high interest rate environment. But also, you know, these tools are being built to sell an insight that is a recurring piece of value to a company. Uh, we can't forget that. And uh, that valuable insight itself is worth, you know, in some sense, less in present terms, because you don't get all of the stacks of coins, you get a diminishing stack of coins. So these two things are like the perfect storm that have on some level uh, created a lot of challenges in the modern data stack in terms of the tools continuing to provide very high levels of value and then essentially uh, the corresponding funding. But, you know, that is not to be confused with these tools are dead. In fact, we see these explosions of these tools. So like we see, you know, I this is uh, one of my favorite graphs. It's a it's a graph that Tristan from DBT shared, which basically shows that uh, a huge fraction of the DBT install base um, creates, you know, uh, this sort of wild uh, set of models. You know, have have you know five percent of the DBT install base uh, has over five thousand models within. Um, effectively within an organization. But what that what that means on some level is that, um, you know, in a in a zero interest rate world, one, companies that get this sort of, uh, you know, stream don't mind sort of, uh, you know, blowing up their costs associated with data um, because they were getting value from it and they were getting a valuable stream from it. Um, as this world changes, it's going to be interesting to see how we think about kind of the sort of um, really sort of uh, explosion of data and data costs. The majority, as we transition from these early adopters to the early majority, the majority makes additional profits and we do need to refocus ourselves on sort of present profits. Uh, by spending less, especially if you have the sort of incredible like uh, data magnitudes, you should be smart about the data that you're using. Are you getting the ROI from that data or optimizing more? So ways in which, you know, I think about this all the time, early startups optimize is they optimize their advertising, they optimize their product efforts, and they optimize their business strategy decisions, typically around a, a variety of metrics that we think of as very important. Um, and when we think about kind of the ways that these tools need to focus, they have to focus on spending less, optimizing more. Today, um, you know, in the MDS world, this is, this is very confused. You know, there's a tenuous link between all the ways in which we use data and, um, and basically the things that create additional profits. This means that there's actually opportunity, opportunity to simplify existing processes, to spend less on people. We've invested in this zero interest rate world, and we should think of the MDS as now having actually more opportunity, not less. Um, similarly, again, there's opportunities to continue to shrink the time to insights and uh, continue to think about ways that insights can be replicable without incredible expense. So uh, I, I recently read sort of a, a Substack post uh, from David from Metaplane, uh, and you know it's very similarly titled to my talk, which is "The MDS is Dead: Long Live the MDS." Um, and you know, in it had become sort of the punching, the you know the punchline of the modern data stack, which is the modern data stack exists to increase Snowflake credit spend. So I think we were all kind of a little bit guilty of not being mindful of ROI. In this zero interest rate world, because of the value or the perpetual value of these insights, um, we sort of took the freedom to go spend a lot on sort of, you know, not just our data warehouse, but all the data infrastructure that surrounds it. And he poses the following challenge. Can the MDS become easier to use? Uh, again, with the context of spending less time and money. 
Um, can the MDS become cheaper to use? Same concept. So a lot of what I think of as the opportunity is trying to figure out how to make, you know, the MDS will continue to thrive and jump and cross the chasm if we can figure out how we can use it um, in a money saving way, not just a money spending way. And that kind of revisits kind of the, the, the theme of the talk, which is, okay, how do we get the MDS to jump to that early uh, majority, the pragmatists? And what I'm going to argue, and from my own personal experiences with Mozart data, we know who the early majority is. Um, and, and jumping to the early majority is nothing new. We've seen this. The A-B testing tools have all been usurped by... Uh, by by marketers and by product folks and by product marketers. The CDPs all have been usurped, have been taken from the data teams and, are, and have owners elsewhere. All the product analytics tools, you know, when I was at companies were always being paid for by product teams. A lot of the best data tools jump from folks with data titles like analytics engineers or data scientists or data analysts, and they jump to the operators. So this is, so Basically, my take is the early majority are the technical operators, um, but this is nothing new. This is what a lot of data tooling looks like. It's, you know, the MDS will be owned by the technical operators because those are the folks with budget and agency. And that, you know, empowers the analytic. This is not a threat. This empowers the analytics engineers, this empowers the data analysts to go work on the high value projects. And, you know, I, I think of this very much to the decentralized versus centralized debate that I've literally been, you know, uh, at data conferences, you know, hearing talks about or talking about myself, um, you know, for a decade. And, you know, the, the main theme is that ultimately budgets reside with these technical operators. And, uh, you know, your tool ultimately can start with the high level of enthusiasts that develop these best practices, but should end up with the folks ultimately with budget. And what that looks like are these technical operators. Operators are upping their game, um, both in terms of being able to write SQL and being able to really understand sort of analytics. Um, I want to share some like Mozart data stat, uh, stats, just sort of that reflect this, this claim. So Mozart data were a data platform for, uh, uh, for startups and where what we see is that sort of growing population of those of those sort of early majority. So about two thirds of our customer base looks like these sort of technical operators. And on many level, uh, they they all write, you know, they all write better SQL than I than I did 10 years ago in my sort of data analyst and data science roles. So you know, I see sort of not just these titles coming about and, and, and seeing data living and residing with these teams, but I'm also seeing the up leveling of these teams, of their games as sort of the really best data practitioners, the, the analytics engineers and the data scientists and, you know, uh, of today have taught them how to think about data and have sort of given sort of um, a path as to how to best think about data. Um, and and they're, they're not just noobs. They create a lot of models, and we see a lot of model creation happening within Mozart data um, and and happening um, out of these data operators that not just like, you know, create data models, but like use the best of these tools um, that think about hygiene, that learn the same sort of painful lessons that we talk about all the time at sort of these uh, at, at sort of the data centric conferences, when we talk about best practices, when we talk about things that have annoyed us, when we talk about things that are going to make data more effective, now these technical operators are learning the same model, uh, sorry, same same lessons and from the same problems. And, um, and they're building out a lot of uh, the same things that we value. Um, and we should embrace this. And we should embrace this as, as an industry because um, there are a lot more operators than there are analytics engineers. Um, I did a very quick search, and you know, if you think about sort of 20x, that's probably it's probably because they're doing some sort of matching uh, in a in a way that favors the ratio here. Um, so there's there's a lot of operators, there's a lot of runway for the MDS, both to be sold, but also to really have impact across the industry. And again, if you think about sort of the thick sort of standard deviations in that in that sort of bell curve, that's you know 
that's you know that's the early majority and that's really the opportunity um, that I see and that I actually see as the growth of the MDS. Um, last, I wanted to end on a uh, Yogi Berra quote. Um, I'm, a, I'm a baseball fan, uh, you know, and this conference is sort of uh, conveniently in the sort of uh, dog days of the summer, uh, just as, you know, about as we're about to hit September baseball and get excited about baseball again. Um, and uh, there's a great Yogi quote, which is, nobody goes there anymore. It's too crowded, you know, sort of referring to restaurants in New York. Um, but I think a lot of that is what we think of as the death of the MDS, which is like, you know, nobody cool is talking about the the MDS anymore. It's too crowded. It's becoming overrun with, uh, you know, uh, operators and technical operators. And um, this is a blessing. Uh, and, and, and when we think about the death of the MDS, we think of it as this sort of transition in some sense. Um, and, and I think a lot of it mirrors this, uh, this sort of ironic, uh, Yogi quote that I've, that I've always enjoyed. And, uh, you know, with that, I sort of speak to my own personal optim, uh, you know, uh, optimism is that it's too crowded means like, uh, the restaurant is at the very least happy and there are still people getting a lot of, uh, surplus from going there. And I think that that's going to be sort of uh, you know, our path as an industry and, um, one that I'm really excited about for the next, um, uh, certainly the next few years and hopefully, uh, decades to come. So with that, um, I want to thank you and answer any questions that, uh, folks might have or, uh, engage in any debate that folks might have around, uh, modern data stacks. So one thing I'll add is Fraser, I certainly would never, never want to knock your parents. I, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think my folks are a few, a few years away from, uh, adopting some of, uh, the benefits of the modern data stack. So, uh, you know, no knock on the parents, but I, I do use my own as, as my, uh, you know, sort of the, the canonical, uh, parts of the curve. Okay, well, um, you know, I'm looking forward to some of the uh, talks coming up. You know, you get to contrast it with uh, Pedram, who will be giving, I'm sure, a really engaging uh, talk next. And um, if there aren't any uh, questions, um, you know, feel free to follow up with me offline. I'm just Pete at MozartData.com and uh, enjoy the MDS Fest.